Yo, what is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining in. I am super excited because we have another episode of The Book Brew, where we talk books, but also drink some brew. And I'm also super excited because we have a very, very special guest here in the channel, being the author of the Sun Eater series, the acclaimed Sun Eater series, the half-mortal himself, Christopher Rocchio. Christopher, thank you so much again for being here. This is a dream come true for me. Honestly, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. I can't thank your manager enough too for allowing you to get on this call with me tonight. So thanks again. And how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing well. If my manager is that my wife or my daughter. Um, <laughs> uh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, man. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And thank you. Uh, thank you for the drinks. Uh, this, is a, this is a nice touch, I must say. No. Now, I'm glad I made it to you. So I know you told me that you're not like too much into the beer scene, which is completely fine. So I got you a variety pack here that's a little bit of like a tropical type of feel because I'm down here in Florida. Cool. It's supposed to be always humid. It's supposed to be always hot down here. But at the moment, like literally today, it's 55 degrees. So I got my jacket on, it's cold as heck. I'm shivering outside when I'm taking my dogs out. So I think for you, I think it's even colder up there, up in uh, like North Carolina, oh, it's, right? Yeah, it's gonna be about 18 tonight, which is about as cold as it ever really gets here. 18? Yeah, Ooh. it's oh uh, it is it's gonna be a little brutal. I know, I know, you know, any Canadians watching are laughing at us, but that's all right. Uh, they don't know about hurricanes, so uh, you know. But uh, yeah, no, no, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna be pretty cold. So. Well, I think the best thing to drink then is obviously a cold beer. All right, so I got you that variety pack, and before we get into the discussion, this whole thing is called the book brew because in the middle of the call, we're just gonna try different brews during the call and see which ones we like the most and then just talk about books. So if that's cool with you, I think the best place to start is one that's called the Kona Light Blonde Ale. Cause I think this one is most like, like the typical beer that you'll get at any sort of like you know, bar or brewery. It's just like a typical you know, blonde ale. So nothing too fruity, nothing too crazy in this one. So hopefully you have that one in front of you too. Yeah, I got it, I got it. Uh, yeah, so I, like you said, not a huge drinker kind of in general. Uh, so if I don't have anything super intelligent to say, that is why. Uh, but, uh, you know, cheers, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, cheers. Thank you so much again for being here. Yeah, no, okay. that's nice. That's, yeah, smooth. Definitely, you know, definitely light beer. But I, uh, like I said, I can't remember the last time I had a beer, honestly. So, uh... <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm happy uh, to be the one to uh, yeah. get you that next that next beer. So you didn't spit it out either. So that's a good sign. Yeah. No. Yeah, <laughs> I'm doing all right. So no, thanks, man. Uh, no, I, uh, I I went through a phase where I was like, okay, if I'm going to be a writer, I need to like, you know, be a writer. And I, uh, you know, I got into whiskey for a little while. Uh, and I, you know, I could say maybe something clever there, but I barely drink, uh, you know, uh, my, my, uh, uh, you know, I'm at, I'm at home by myself all the time, which does not feel like the environment to get too into whiskey. You know, so mm -hmm. um, so I don't uh, I don't I don't drink that that often. But uh, this is a nice change. So uh, yeah, no, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And before we get into some questions about you know outside of your books, I wanted to dive into your books first because I know you know most people joining the call or joining this this video are obviously interested in your books because they know you for the Sun Eater series and how amazing that series is. So, you know, there, currently there's five books out, right? All the way from Empire of Silence to Ashes of Man. And I know Disquiet Gods, you know, book number six, is supposed to come out, I think in March or April, right? April next 2nd, year? yeah. April yeah. 2nd, okay. So that one's that one's good to go, right? Like that's... It is done, yeah. Uh, it, is, uh, it is It is. written, it is edited, it is copy edited. It is currently with a typesetter whose job it is to, you know, take the book from Word document to the pages that you actually see. So they, they worry about uh, line breaks and paragraph breaks and page breaks and chapter breaks and, you know, font styles and, and kerning and spacing and all that stuff, right? Um, that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty, that can be a pretty involved process sometimes, especially if it's like a oh, yeah. weird manuscript, but, uh, you know, that should be done, uh, sometime, you know, it's, it's November 20th, by the end of the year, it'll be done, uh, for sure. Um, because, uh, Bain is going to have changed publishers and Bain books is a little weird. They, uh, they do something no one else does, uh, and that is make their advanced reader copies available for purchase as eBooks. So oh, wow. okay. um, if you want to read Disquiet Gods in January, uh, you totally can. 
uh, that'll be on Bane.com exclusively. You can't get it anywhere else. But they've got uh, they got the ebook up there, uh, the e arc up there uh, in Moby EPUB. Uh, you can get an RTF if you want, uh, <laughs> and those are all DRM free, so you can load it onto your Kindle, no problem. Um, and uh, they are more expensive. Uh, Bane posts their e arcs for I think fifteen bucks, but it's not that much more expensive than like a Penguin Random House ebook these days. And uh, all that goes directly to the publisher and to me. So I actually get something like three times the amount I get from an actual finished book uh, if you buy oh, wow. that book early. So, uh, you know, if you want to if you want to help the series out, that is a that is a way to do it. Uh, and you get to read it early, and it's it's pretty close to final. There won't be like there's some because I worked for Bain for seven years. There were some books uh, the authors were like so late getting the books in that it was like literally the first draft was the arc, mm -hmm. and then the final draft was substantially different. That's not going to be true in this case. It's just going to be a matter of like some commas being cleaned up and maybe some word choice changing uh unless you're a very discerning attentive reader it is essentially final and if you're uh, ebook inclined and you want to help the series and you don't want to wait uh yeah i think it'll be january 10th that will be out um, Wow! and then uh you know you could get the hardcover in april so um, that's exciting yeah all yeah. sending your fans well i think we'll definitely flock to that I do know that you have some new fans, though, with uh, those being kind of big players in the booktube industry. Oh, yeah, with, sure. Uh, the latest uh, you know, Daniel Green video that came out not too long ago. And obviously Mike. You know, Mike is the, is the one where I was first introduced to yeah. Sun Eater. And I think a, a, what's really funny as a, a way to judge where people first joined the Red Company or started their, their journey to the Sun Eater series is when or what books were available on hardcover at that time they started their journey. Because when I started, <laughs> when I started, Howling Dark was easily available on Amazon. I just clicked, you know, buy like normal, and it shipped to me two days later. So I think it's really uh, interesting to see this this growth since I first watched that video of Mike, you know, a couple of years ago. So it's it's awesome to see that you got these big these these, these big booktubers now, you know, flocking to your book. So I bet that it's awesome for you to see as well. Yeah, it's it's great. You know, I I'm just glad no one's hated it yet. Uh, you know, every time I hear one of them is you know I, you know Patrick's reading it or, or or Daniel Green's reading it or whoever, uh, I I uh, you know I I clench up for a couple weeks uh, until the mm -hmm. video comes out. So far, I've been okay. Um, you know, but uh, it, you know it helps that I you know the book's not the book's not terrible. I think, but um, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it's still, you know, it's still always a, a matter of taste. And if someone's taste does not run in the same direction as mine, you know, that, that, that's not good if that person has half a million, you know, followers or something. So far, <laughs> I've been very blessed to uh, not have reached that particular impasse. So, so that's, that's good. And, um, you know, I was saying this to Mike earlier, uh, cause I was on his channel earlier today mm -hmm. for recording, uh, that, uh, the booktube's really uh, played a, a pivotal role in sort of, I don't want to say salvaging my career or anything quite like that seriously, but the first two books released um, to like pretty modest fanfare, let's say. Uh, they were doing all right. Um, book one earned out, I think, by the time book three came out, which is, that's not unusual. Um, but it wasn't an overnight success, you know, or anything or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, book three came out in July of 2020, so like nobody bought it. Um, there were uh, there were pre-orders, but the the pandemic was was mm -hmm. really good for re, uh, for writers that readers already had heard of, right? People's uh, lockdown reading plans were like, oh, I will finally read, you know, the Corpus of Stephen King. I will finally read Game of Thrones, right? I like to show, okay, maybe the books end better, um, you know, <laughs> um, you know, or, or something like that. But right, but writers who weren't already uh, a big deal didn't really get discovered as a consequence because nobody was nobody was browsing and uh you know it was also the case too that like money was tight for people so mm -hmm. um so demon white came out and uh underperformed book two um and um and, and there was a it's never quite recovered right if you look at like the uh the sort of drop off on the number of uh, ratings it has on like amazon right there's a much sharper decline uh between uh two and three than there is between three and four or four and five you know and it, it's normal for a series uh sort of to to attenuate like that sort of uh like asymptotically but uh, but it was a little sharp and um i didn't help that there was in a like a two-year gap between demon white coming out and kings of death mm -hmm. uh which is my longest you know gap between books ever uh some 
uh, personal stuff that was slowing me down at the time. Uh, and um, and so with uh, you know, yeah, Demon White being the chunkiest one out of the lot, like had somewhat of an impact to people jumping into it during the pandemic. I think it was like the biggest book, um, not by far, but still a pretty chunky book. You think like the page count kind of deterred people a little bit in terms of you know st- continuing. No, I, I just people didn't know it was out. Um, oh, I, okay. Yeah, I because I, what happens when a new book comes out is uh, the publishers go to their sales team and usually. Um, so like DAW was sort of semi-independent they uh, at the time they could uh, they've since been acquired by another company I have no idea how it works now but they they could make all of their editorial calls uh, completely right they, they decided like which authors to acquire uh, which books to print um, you know how many etc uh, but they couldn't make some like high level business decisions so like right before Penguin uh, uh, cut them loose they forced them to move out of their offices uh, oh, man. Of, okay. uh, of like 40 years and, and into Penguin's offices. And then they, they, they cut them loose literally like a year later. It was, it was pretty awful. Um, but, uh, but the sales team is, uh, is Penguin's, right? So Daw would come to Penguin's sales team uh, and they, uh, and they have, you know, a rep that sells to uh, Barnes and Noble, right? And they have a rep who sells to Books A Million. They have a rep who sells to uh, independent bookstores in the Southeast, right? Independent mm-hmm. bookstores in the Northeast, whatever. Um, you know, there's a guy whose job it is to sell books to Walmart, um, you know, okay. and, and they say, hey, this is what we've got going, you know, um, you know, this is what we're, you know, doing to promote it. Um, you know, what can you guys do for us? Basically, what are you interested in? Every now and then, like, you know, one of the reps will, will, will do something like sort of special or the publisher will like incentivize or something. But with everything sort of like shut down, it's not clear to me that that aspect of the publisher was functioning normally. Like, I don't know if those meetings took place or if those meetings took place, they took place like via Zoom and maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. books are getting the same sort of coverage um, that they would have gotten normally. And maybe those meetings didn't happen at all. I have no clue, right? Uh, And so I just don't know that the the, the books that came out in that window were especially, uh, you know, marketed uh, as heavily or as as carefully as as earlier. And that could be like totally off base, right? It could simply be the fact that people weren't buying because like, they had to get toilet paper, right? Or, or whatever. Oh, right? mm-hmm. It was bad for everything, you know, uh, back then. Uh, the point is, is that that book didn't, that book didn't do so good. And then Mike comes along, uh, <laughs> at the end of 2020, maybe the end of 21. Uh, I can't remember at this point. Um, I think it was 2020. Um, and and reads the book, and you know, I think he had about 50,000 subscribers at the time. He was above 100 now, and um, and that that really that really sort of brought things back. Uh, it made it so that the gap from that review to the release of book four was much stabler. And, um, and you know, book two is right. Once, once one mm-hmm. uh, relatively high profile person reviews a book, it's only a matter of time before a bunch of the smaller channels will pick it up, you know, out of curiosity. And there's like these little, these little waves where like a book will get circulated <laughs> around, around book two. And sometimes, you know, it happens really, really quickly. And sometimes it happens really quickly and then stops. And then there's like a second wave. And it feels like that's what's kind of happening right now uh, between between uh, Patrick and um, you know, uh, Daniel and- uh, Have you checked out the um, Goodreads like book statistics, like line chart? Like after Daniel's video went out, like there was a spike in people adding it to their TBR. Like in the line chart, there was like a spike. It's like a green spike that went straight up. For no, you know, it's cool silence. Uh, so. Full disclosure: I have a um, like a productivity manager app on all of my devices uh, that I got specifically to stop me from looking at Goodreads. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yes. Uh, it's not all it does. It prevents me from like looking at YouTube for most hours of the day, so that I can actually work. Because uh, <laughs> left to my own devices, like I will just watch like hours of random nonsense, right? And uh, so I do not leave myself to my own devices. Um, and uh, but one of the things I, I did is uh, is I, I stopped myself from reading reviews uh, because like early on you like you want to know like how is the new book doing right and I still look at like the number on Amazon or whatever mm-hmm. right but um, but I was finding that you know I could look at a hundred reviews and ninety eight of them could be effusive right but then all I would think about are the other two right yeah. and and mm-hmm. uh, and I think it's true for anybody you know like you shouldn't read the comments right uh, you know you shouldn't you know. 
Um, I think if if uh, the day ever comes where everything is negative, like I would need to you know sit down and have like a serious talk with myself. But by and large, like if everybody is if everybody's happy, everything's positive. Um, there's not really a sense in looking at negative reviews unless you like hate yourself. And so, uh, and I do. So I had to like stop myself from doing that, uh, you know. And so, uh, so I uh, I haven't looked at Goodreads in, in years, um, and uh, and I, and I think that's probably wise because the temptation to engage with one's critics is often uh, overwhelming, and it is always a mistake. Um, the only thing you should say to your critics is uh, thank you for reading. You know, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. At least specifically, you can address you know criticisms more generally. But the only thing you should say to a person. Who doesn't like your work is uh, I'm sorry it wasn't for you. Thank you for taking a chance. I, you know, I hope you'll try again, you know, someday with something mm-hmm. else, um, rather than being like, now listen here, uh, you know, <laughs> you're wrong because actually, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Um, it, it's, it's never, um, it's never a good look. It's never gracious um, to do that. Uh, now you can address like specific criticisms. Like I've, I've talked before, like the the people who. Uh, say the book is like too much like Dune or like completely missing the point, right? And uh, uh, and I, I have like very little patience for that criticism at this point. But if someone like makes it, you know, to me, like, you know, it, the the response is, I'm sorry you feel it. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, it's not. Now listen here, uh, let me teach you about illusions and meta text. Uh, did you go to school? No, right? It's just like that's not cool, right? Um, yeah. Now you listen here. Hadrian Marlowe is the best character ever written. Okay, listen up. Right. Uh, uh, real quick, I know you've been in like the publishing world for a while because I, you know, I watch your YouTube channel. I think your YouTube channel is great. And every time you introduce yourself, you know, you're saying you're the a veteran in the publishing industry for I think seven or eight years now. It's eight. Yeah, it'll be it'll be nine in January. Um, nine in January. Wow. So that is awesome. So when you first started at Bain, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, Bain, right? Mm-hmm. And then you know, being a full time author now. In terms of BookTube, like was BookTube in terms of DAW or even Bain, was that ever like a focus in the marketing team or just a strategy for people to focus on, hey, you need to reach out to BookTubers because they make an impact. Like, no, was that ever uh, a thing? No, I, uh, I, I started, so I was still there, I think. When, yeah, it must, so it must've been 2020 uh, when Mike did his review because I was still, I was still there. And um, sort of right as I was on my way, I was like, look, like these guys, you know, like, l- let me show you my sales graph, right? Because I used to be able to have Penguin Random House's, uh, you know, mm-hmm. weekly numbers, right? And I was like, look, uh, this is like way better than putting ads in convention program books. Like we should do this, right? We should talk to these people. Because it wasn't clear to me that a lot of people were, uh, like even three years ago. Um, I was like, look, just get in early, like give them free books, right? Like stop, like this is so easy. Like just do this, please. And um, I'm not sure that I, I made a, a very strong enough. I, I don't think my, my my case was made strongly enough at the time. Uh, but before that, no, nobody was nobody was was looking at BookTube or TikTok at all. Um, and, and at least with regard to promoting either Sun Eater stuff with Daw or in my mm-hmm. in meetings at Bain, like nobody nobody was looking at it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to throw my agent under the under the bus uh, somewhat comedically, but I uh, I suggested in a like phone conversation with her back in like 2015. I was like, I should make a YouTube channel, and she's like, you should make a blog. And I was like, that sounds wrong, but if you think the YouTube channel is a bad idea, I won't do it because it sounds like a lot of work. Uh, and uh, I could have started it like five years earlier than I did because uh, I started it wow. uh, really okay. because of the uh, of lockdown too. Because I used to do like six to eight conventions a year and I needed a substitute for that. And now, frankly, it feels like I don't really need to do the conventions. I just online is <laughs> probably more effective. That's great. Well, um, I think we're at a good point now to actually jump into the second beer. Go ahead. And no, we're not drinking the full can, so don't don't worry about drinking the full can at all. I do not want to get you um, right. you know, intoxicated. Yeah. Got a little no, one no, I've, I've had like five sips. I won't be happy, so don't yeah. worry. So the next one, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a trip here, and that's going to be Liquid Aloha. So definitely going a little bit tropical. Cool. Hopefully you got that one in. Yeah, I've got them all. Yeah. That perfect. They're all lined up here in a row, so. So this one should transport you to Hawaii. So let's see if your, uh, your background just transforms to you having uh, beaches in the background.
Oh yeah. All right. Yeah, that's there a little, we go. A little is fruitier the right word? You know, <laughs> I I was a waiter for like seven years, and so I like, but for most of that, I uh, I wasn't allowed to, or for the first like, half of it, I wasn't allowed to drink because uh, you could serve alcohol at eighteen. You can't yeah. drink it until you're twenty one. So I had to like wrote memorize like wine terminology because it was an Italian place. It was mostly wine. And I had like no idea what I was talking about um, uh, at all. And uh, it, uh, the the work of a sommelier still like completely confounds me. You know, they're like, ah, this this grape juice has notes of shoe leather and chocolate. <laughs> and I'm like, look, I describe nonsense for a living. And that is on a whole nother level, man. Like, I just don't, I just don't so know. What's a good wine pairing to drink to also reading the Sun Eater series? You, you got a good preference there? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, my favorite wine is uh, is Amarone, which is a Valpolicella. It's a it's a sort of heavier red. Um, it's uh, it's kind of chocolatey. Uh, Ooh, is, uh, okay. But it's 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 really good. It's kind of uh, it's kind of obscure. Um, you know, it's not like the sort of the go tos. It's not Cabernet. It's not Chianti. Uh, but it's kind of. Um, it's kind of got some like dessert notes to it, but it's not like a fortified wine or anything like that. It just uh, it would go well with like some sort of like smoky, savory stuff, but also like mm -hmm. chocolate stuff, right? Like like dessert. Um, but it's it's really good stuff. I, I've never had a bad bottle. Um, Do you like like, um, like chocolatey type of drinks? Because there is a beer by Yingling, who Yingling has like is one of the oldest breweries in America. Yeah. And it's just like a traditional lager, but they have a comp like a, a collaboration with Hershey's chocolate to where it's a, a mish or a, a mashup of Yingling and Hershey's to where when you drink it, it tastes like normal Yingling. And then the aftertaste is just straight up Hershey's. So That's if you like chocolate things, oh. I mean that uh, it was uh, it was refreshing. Actually, it was really good. So maybe you should cool. check it out. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I like chocolate things, but uh that's interesting. I, that, that sounds like the uh, the work of some mad food scientist. Uh, <laughs> you know, if they can get the the finish that separate from the uh, you know the the foretaste, that's uh, that's really something. But yeah, no, so you're pairing like it's it's got to be dark red, man. I don't know. Um, you gotta go like full uh, over the top. But I feel like that's something that Hadrian would drink too. A dark, a nice dark red. Yeah, mm -hmm. he uh, you know it's it's dramatic and uh, the the man does drink so. Uh, <laughs> There's sometimes I'm like, is this too much? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, trying to go for the, uh, the like sort of, you know, pagan Roman, like, you know, uh, hard drinking kind of thing. But of course they watered all their wine. Uh, it's not clear to me that the Solons are watering their wine. So, <laughs> um, hey, going back to your YouTube channel real quick. Um, so, I, I mean, I love the YouTube channel again. I think it's great that you keep all of us up to date on, you know, what's going on. You're interacting with the audience. You're talking to people, answering their questions. Now, on the flip side of that, do you ever think that you having a channel is a deterrent for YouTubers to make content on the Sun Eater in terms of like deep lore videos? Kind of like Quinn's ideas, how he does deep, you know, deep dive ins, into like the Dune series. Do you ever see that like with you are having your own channel, you're talking about what's going on, you have summaries of your books. What do you think on, on that? So I hadn't actually thought of it as a deterrent before, but there's sort of like a converse thing that I have thought about, which is um, that it has, I think, given people the impression that either I am a bigger operation than I am, or <laughs> that I am like responsible for things that I don't want to be responsible for, right? So I'll have people message me like, why isn't there a wiki? And I'm like, I don't know, because y'all haven't <laughs> made one. Uh, you know, that's not like, you think You think Brandon Sanderson is like tapping out articles on, on you know, mistborn.wikia.com or whatever it is? Like, probably not, although, you know, it's, you know, maybe. Uh, he, you know, he writes a lot, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's not me, right? Uh, I've got, uh, I've got books to write and, uh, and, and I think just the fact that it exists at all, people presume maybe that I have more help than I do. It's just me and my wife, right? She makes the thumbnails and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I edit the videos. And so there are not more videos because a day that I spend editing a video is a day I'm not working on book seven. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, that's why like everything is a live stream. Cause like those require like no work, right. You just show up and, and go, yeah. uh, and I do like the one video a month. Right. And, and the exceptions are maybe like cover reveal videos or those book summaries and those, you know, or, or maybe I've got a new like, bit of music or something up, but, um, but I've thought about, like, I should do lore videos. I, um, I have a reader 
who uh, is like a big Minecraft YouTuber and he, uh, or like million subscribers plus, right? And he was like, you should make lore videos. And like, you are correct. Like I 100% <laughs> should. Uh, but, um, and, and, and he pointed out like, it's, it's not beyond, you know, anyone's means to like pay for an editor or something like that, but it's still, it's still work that's, um, taking away from a day that I'm, uh, working on the novel and like writing is very much a momentum driven process. Um, you know, if I were to stop writing for three days, it would be a lot harder to get going again, especially if I had to stop like mid chapter or something. This is part of what made this quite God took me 288 days to write and it shouldn't have. Um, but if I go and look at my spreadsheet, there's something like 60 of those. I didn't even get to work, uh, for various reasons, right? I was sick. Uh, you know, my wife was sick, right? Um, you know, uh, I don't know. There, I don't, it could be anything, right? Like I had a flat tire. I had to do way too many errands, whatever. I, I, if I have a doctor's appointment at the wrong time of day, like I am done. Like I'm not gonna be able to get back to work after that. Like it's gotta, you know, I gotta be done writing before I leave the house, you know? So, uh, whatever the reason is. And, um, you know, since my daughter was born, I've been a lot more precise about how I manage that schedule. Cause like, you know, she needs time and deserves attention and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, uh, so the writing needs to happen on her time. And, uh, that means I get up really early now. So, huh, really, yeah, early. I was gonna actually ask you that in terms of like your writing environment, like, are you able to write with like things happening in the background? Are you able to write like in a drive through at a McDonald's or do you need like absolute silence in order to actually like physically write or you write on your keyboard? Like, what does that um, environment look like for you? You know, so lately it looks like this. Um, you know, I uh, we bought this house. The third floor was completely unfinished. Uh, the walls weren't even in. Uh, it was weird. The shower was, but like nothing else up here was, uh, which is very strange. And um, <laughs> and so uh, I had a guy do the drywall, but my father and I did basically everything else. Uh, the only thing we didn't do besides the drywalling was. Uh, was install the HVAC stuff up here. We did the electrical, we did the plumbing, um, you know, that wasn't already here, right? The shower, again, was just sitting in the middle of an otherwise like empty, you know, mm -hmm. plywood and, and, and two by fours, third floor. So like all this was was us, uh, you know, like my dad did this, the wood paneling and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I finished it all, um, you know, and um, so I, uh, I got this really nice office and I would be a fool not to like take advantage of the fact that I have it. And so, um yeah so i've done most of my writing here but i um i do i do write to music with the condition that it can't be um it can't have words because if there are words i'm listening to the words mm -hmm. uh you know and i am um because i I'm, I'm very auditory um all my sort of word processing is not quite out loud but i will mumble to myself and sub vocalize as i'm writing and if i've got dio singing in the background like that is gonna cross <laughs> Uh, that's gonna cross uh, contaminate pretty badly and I won't be able to focus um, so sometimes maybe I'll take a break and listen to it like a like a like an actual song with words but I'll uh, mostly write to classical music or to soundtrack music um, if I write to music at all very often I, I don't I, I just sit here quietly but I, I'm not fussy um, you know there are some writers who you know will only write their books longhand in their special writing shack that they built themselves uh, on the property of their second house. And <laughs> like, that's not me. Like that's, that's so silly. And I, I really, I don't like when writers talk like that, like that's their process, but I think it gives aspiring writers the notion that like writing is very hard. It's very ritualized and it's very mm -hmm. like elite. And if you don't have, you know, your writing shack on the property of your second house, you can't write. And so I don't, I don't like when writers speak that way. Um, I, uh, I used to write whenever I could, wherever I could. When I was in college, I had my laptop, obviously, for class. And so yeah. if I had two hours between class, I would sit, you know, on the quad, in the student union, wherever, write and, and, and work as much as I could. Because um, I also worked like six nights a week through college, you know, waiting tables. And so, um, it, you know, it had to happen. I, I really needed book one to get done by the time I graduated because I didn't really have a backup. Um, I kind of backed into the job at Bain in the first place through an internship program that I wasn't planning on. Um, I hadn't planned on having an actual publishing job. I didn't know what I was going to get, um, you oh, know, okay. uh, and they were, and I, and they're like, you know, we have like a science fiction publisher in Wake Forest. And I was like, we, what, uh, <laughs> why are they here? Why aren't they in New York where, you know, they're supposed to be. 
And um, so that was like a whole surprise, right? Um, and um, so I, um, and I still like, I, I, I try to write on the plane when I have to fly to conventions. That is, that that's hard. I, I think I'm gonna give that up because that sucks. Uh, planes are awful. Uh, but I'll write like mm. at conventions in the hotel. I wrote Lesser Devil um, mostly over the course of the 2018 World Con because I flew all the way to California and they didn't give me any panels. Uh, so I just, <laughs> it was like a complete waste of time. Um, and so uh, I just, I stayed at my friend's house and sat by the pool and wrote, so. Wow, that is, that's not good for them to not get any panels, man. Come well, on. you know, it's okay. They have, a, they have a lot of people going and uh, panels mm -hmm. are overrated anyway. It's just, you know, I didn't have anywhere to be. Um, and I don't like, uh, I don't like like watching panels at conventions. Um, uh, I, I find, I, I, don't, I think the way they're structured is uh, sort of anti-conversational because you'll like, the moderator mm -hmm. will ask a question and they'll ask seven people on the panel the answer, you know, to answer the question. And by the time the third person has spoken, it is impossible for the other people to say anything that hasn't already been said, right? <laughs> it's like, what yeah. is urban fantasy? How are we supposed to get seven answers to a question that has like one answer? right like it's pretty obvious what it is um you know uh so i uh, i like never when i go to conventions i never go sit on panels i just walk around and buy dvds uh you know so uh well, i i had nothing to do so i wrote lesser devil which was a it was a pretty good trade i think you know lesser devil was a a lot of fun and actually going to lesser devil i i hear your name now is uh crispin richie have you heard this at all in terms of your name? Yeah, I, I, I have heard, you know, I've been called worse, uh, <laughs> but uh, but that was uh, that was definitely a new one. So uh, I thought it was just hilarious that we got, you know, at least we got a character from the book. I mean, we got Crispin Ritchie in there. You know what's funny is that every time I hear your last name, I think to Brian Lee Durfee, because in his <laughs> yeah, videos, sure. he like overemphasizes your last name. Empire of Silence. Book one of the Sun Eater Saga by my friend and fellow writer, Christopher Rocchio. That's right, Rocchio. Rocchio, Rocchio in all his videos. So now every time I see your last name, like on, on any book, I, I just, Riley Durfee comes to mind now for me. You know, I was, I was saying this to Mike earlier, um, I, like I really wonder how many minutes of my life Brian has saved me, uh, you know, because I don't have to explain <laughs> how to pronounce my name to people. Uh, thanks to Brian, uh, I, I think it's I think there maybe have been like two or three reviews I've seen where someone didn't know, right? And uh, you know that's uh, man, uh, Brian is Brian's the man. One like he is a he's just a he's he's awesome. Uh, but uh, but I really do owe him one for that because. Uh, you know, I, uh, my, my wife, uh, God bless her, her maiden name was Perry, and uh, now her life is hell. Uh, you know, so. Um, Look what you like, done, how, man. Yeah, she's like, how do you how do you live like this? I'm like, it's, you get used to it. Uh, it's fine. Um, but uh, I do sometimes wish I'd gotten a pen name, uh, just to sidestep the whole, the whole issue. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, but it's cool, you know. You know, I've taught several thousand people now to say my very obscure, very uncommon last name. And, uh, that's a life skill that will not avail them in any circumstances, but it makes my family's life a little bit easier on occasion. Uh, so that's cool. And going to your your time management again, I know you're talking about how um, like you prioritize your time in terms of you, you have that dedicated time to write. But you know, you're here with me, a little itty bitty YouTuber like me you're going out to different um you know different interviews as well like mike and um a whole bunch of interviews that i've seen you in which is awesome to see i mean you're interacting with so many people on discord not not just your own discord but multiple discords and you're just you know doing so much even and also having a, a newborn basically so like how do you how do you even have time to write like do you wake up at the crack of dawn at 3 a.m and write from three to five or it's, is, it's really funny you said that today of all days because I did uh, actually. My uh, <laughs> my daughter woke up at like three thirty, uh, wanting to be fed, so we I did we, we did that, and uh, by the time that was done, it was like four forty, and I was gonna get up at five, so I was like, I guess I'm getting up at three thirty today. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't start exactly then, but it was uh, 
because I figure, oh, I'm not supposed to be awake yet. I can just, uh, I can just sit here and, and, and chill for a minute. Um, but I did. I wrote, uh, I wrote like 1,200 words this morning, and then I had a bunch of other stuff I had to do today. You know, I was on, on stream with Mike. I had a, a bunch of errands I had to run for you know, the house. I had to go get groceries and stuff like that. Right. So, um, you know, the nice thing is I don't have a regular job anymore. Right. So uh, mm -hmm. it makes everything else a little bit easier. But um, but like some of that stuff has to go. Right. And the other thing, uh, like I really do. I think the Discord stuff's going to have to start getting start getting paired back um, uh, because I, I will like doom scroll, you know, uh, ad infinitum if left to my own devices. Um, and uh, my, I, I find that my relationship with my phone is becoming increasingly abusive and it just needs to uh, get out of my life. You know, I, I, if it wasn't for like maps and like the baby management apps, like it would be gone already. I, I'd go like get a flip phone and be that guy. Um, you should but, look into uh, those dumb phones. Like they make those phones that strictly, uh, you, you can make a phone call, you can text message and they have maps too on them now. So they're dumb enough to where you limit your time on the phone itself, but you're not like scrolling on Twitter or anything or you Yeah. Know. I, I I've thought about I thought about doing that. I thought too, right, that my uh my, my daughter should see at least one adult who's not a slave to the rhythm. And uh, you know, as if it's not gonna be me, uh, I don't know who it's gonna be. So um, you know, I, I somebody somebody has to model like sane pre smartphone human behavior. Uh, uh at least, you know, that's how, how I feel about it, so well, I think it's a good time now. I can't believe we're already on the third beer now, but I think it's a good time to move to the third one. Yeah, Hopefully sure. with sips already of, uh, what was it? Liquid Aloha. The next one, we're gonna go to uh, Island Lager. Cool, so, cool. Yeah, lagers, they're yeah, like my favorite um, like beer that I usually gravitate towards. I'm not sure why, it's just uh, a good taste to me, so hopefully you enjoy it. Cool, cool. Well, cheers, man. Cheers again. Oh, oh yeah, very smooth taste to it. A little yeah, bit, but like more substantial too than the uh, the last two, I think. Yeah, I don't even like. I'm not a beer connoisseur either, so I can't like describe it in terms of like. This one has more hops than the other one. I can't, I can't tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, good. Then I'm I'm in good company because I was afraid I was going to be clowning myself here. It's like ah, tastes of. <laughs> What's the line from Community? Tastes of bog. Um, <laughs> uh. Hmm. That would be me. Um, yeah, no, I, I've never figured out the vocabulary for like any of that stuff, uh, which again is weird given my professional history. But uh, but I was, yeah, you know, uh, I, I I could talk far more detail about chicken parmesan than I can uh, about <laughs> about about beer. So. so have you ever heard of this TikTok trend of the Roman Empire? Yeah, is this the like uh, like why do men think about the Roman Empire thing? Uh, okay, yeah. Exactly where I'm going towards because uh, my wife asked me this question. I was like, well, you see, the fun of your series is uh, loosely you know inspired by the Roman Empire, and she's like, are you, are you serious? You're being serious? I'm like, yeah. And then <laughs> apparently, like this is a thing now to where a lot of people are just randomly thinking about the Roman Empire, but. I was like, well, it's true in the sun here. I mean, look in the covers. I mean, it clearly has some Roman inspiration from it as well. So, oh yeah, no, I was a I was a classic student. My my degree very helpfully uh, is in English rhetoric and and, and the classics. Uh, so uh, I had this background anyway. You know, I my wife didn't even bother asking me this question uh, <laughs> because she knew the answer was I never stop. Uh, you know, uh, it's not how often do I think about the Roman Empire. It's you know, I I literally. There's a spot on my staircase, uh, the way the house was built, uh, there's like a weird little peninsula that sticks out into the stairs, but it's too small to really access, so we couldn't leave it open, so I had to put a railing all the way around it. And mm -hmm. an armor mannequin is 100% going right in the middle of it, because it's just big enough. And uh, I uh, I used to, when I was downstairs still, there used to be a, a Roman helmet visible in the background, but I, I've been slowly putting together a first century uh, Gallic campaign Centurion armor set. Uh, very slowly, I haven't bought a new piece in a couple of years because that's just I've, I've known where it's going, and that the place for it hadn't existed until fairly recently. 
Oh, so I haven't bought anything, um, but I've been sort of building it from like the skin up. So I've got uh, I've got the tunic, I've got the socks because uh, they would they did wear socks and sandals, man. Uh, I got cold <laughs> up there, and the, uh, you know we Italians were not used to that, so uh, you know. But uh, I, I've slowly been putting it together. I've got the helmet. Um, I have the I have a, a gladius. Uh, a couple other things. I've been slowly putting all that together for the stairs uh but uh so, so so my wife knew the answer to that question it's it is interesting though i think the thing that's most most interesting about that whole trend is just that like it was it was about a sex difference uh it was a big conversation the country had and really the world had i guess about a sex difference that like wasn't acrimonious in any way like all the women online were just like you do <laughs> really uh -huh. why and i'm like i'm so glad you asked like <laughs> <laughs> um and it was like it was it was like kind of you know it was kind of nice and it was like yeah of course i do right like and it's not just that like do you want to know about mesopotamia like like what are we uh what do you want to talk about <laughs> um as my my wife would and does frequently you know trying to go to bed and she'll be like hey so like what's like the crusades T talk to me and then i'll just go and like i'm getting like amped up about it and she's like out cold and like I'm sitting here, you know, I'm like, oh, well, good night. Uh, you just used me as, I guess, a, a bedtime machine. story right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm over here like, man, I'm thinking about the Sixth Crusade and, and Frederick II. And uh, and I'm like, I need to go. Uh, I need. I, I just need to go calm down. Like, I was getting way too excited about the 13th century. So. Uh, that yeah, so hilarious. This, that, yeah. Uh, your wife brought it up to you because uh, it randomly came up to me as well. So. I know you're trying to you know, distance yourself a little bit from like the uh, like social medias out there. Even myself, like I have a TikTok account for like my, my channel, but I rarely rarely go on you know, TikTok, so I'm not really in like the book talk scene. But I know the, the whole Roman Empire like question wasn't geared towards you know books anyway. It's just a general question, so it's just funny to see that even it made its way to you as well so yeah well some of the like youtube channels that i watch were were laughing about it right uh, some of the history channels and things like that were like what is going on guys <laughs> uh, but uh, but no it's it, it's interesting right cuz um you know there's that old meme about like those who are like ignorant of history or like doomed to repeat which i think is i think is a little bit uh, i don't i don't think it's wrong but i think it's a little bit said too much right and people say too much about it but the degree to which people like don't think about this stuff is is what's so interesting to me. Like it was, I, I was sort of looking at it the other way. It's like you don't think about it like at all. Like you've never thought about it. Uh, why? Like it's very important. It existed for like two thousand years, and you don't think about it. Um, and everyone's like, "Whoa, whoa two thousand years!" Like, yeah, the East counts, bro. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know why people don't count that. Why? Because they spoke Greek. What's wrong with you? Um, but. Um, you know, no, it's, um, obviously I think about it all the time, so, uh. So now we know, everybody, Roman Empire is always in Christopher Rocchio's head, so, um, always good to know that. Going back to your books real quick, book number one, you know, Empire of Silence, mm -hmm. there's a great, um, like, blurb on it from Kevin J. Anderson on, like, the very front cover of, mm -hmm. like, the U.S. edition and the, uh, was it? You, your European edition as well? Yeah, it's it's a UK edition, but they uh, okay, they okay. sell to the world English market. Uh, so Daw has rights in North America, and these it, it's sort of weird because it uh, the US market includes like its former colonial territory, so like the Philippines. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you live in the Philippines, you can get the Daw edition. But if you live like you know just you know on the next the next set islands over, you have to get the other edition. Um, my UK publisher covers. The rest of the world in english so if you're buying an english copy in germany you're getting the uk edition if you're buying it in singapore you're getting the uk edition australia uk edition india mm -hmm. uk edition um but uh but sorry the uh kevin anderson quote um, <laughs> and i was just gonna ask um like what was that process of getting like you know kevin j anderson who is pretty huge with his own ips you know orc works on like the dune series as well yeah. like what was that process of getting a guy that you know, caliber on on your book uh, yeah so just came out uh so uh with kevin specifically uh i actually know kevin um so uh he used to 
Uh, well, he still does. He still has a small press called Wordfire, which mostly exists to keep Kevin's gigantic backlist in print because Kevin's written like 150 books. Um, and it's hard if you have that many books uh, to keep them all in print, right? Now, like the Star Wars oh, ones, yeah. like Del Rey's got those covered, right? But like a bunch of his own stuff in his own universes, um, it might not be possible for him to get a traditional publisher to like want to pick up, I don't know, the like Clockwork Angels uh, Rush tie-in novel that he wrote or something like that, right? Um, you know, maybe like he just can't get a contract for it. So Kevin has a publisher that like puts out, you know, these books that Kevin hasn't been able to find a place for. So, because otherwise he has this whole book he's written that he, that isn't on shelves anywhere, right? It's collecting dust. It's not making him money. And um, there are like, you know, that, like that's a problem, right? So he uh, branched out and he started publishing other writers. And um, he had a, um, a, a dealer, a vendor, that he sold through at conventions that went around and sold all of his word fire books but also like brought in his traditional publishing stuff as well so like kevin was headlining the booth and he had a bunch of these other little writers he picked up who were you know running the booth you know working it you know as part of the price of coming to the show and um there was some overlap between his sort of word fire writers and some bane writers and so we did some work with him uh at conventions and when i was working at bane uh, I met Kevin my first Dragon Con because mm -hmm. I went to Dragon Con I think every year from 2016 to 2019. I obviously didn't go 2020 and I went 21 and uh, I haven't been since, but I'd like to go back. It's a great show. If you've never been, it's huge uh, and uh, it can be a bit expensive, but it's you know uh, all downtown Atlanta basically turns into sci-fi Mardi Gras for Labor Day <laughs> weekend, which is kind of cool uh and um so we're working with kevin's booth and um uh i asked kevin if he would do a blurb and he said sure and he did um so that was that was easy um yeah, that's great so, some of the blurbs like uh like the james corey blurb uh daniel abraham was the half of james corey that read it yeah uh my agent asked him if he would uh she knew him uh, she had represented him i think still does but i'm not 100 sure uh and so she asked for me um a bunch of the blurbs that i got though were just bane writers uh bane actually got me more blurbs on empire of silence than dodger <laughs> uh, are you sick so, like, wow that's interesting they uh just did me a favor uh you mm -hmm. know I, I was working for them and uh you know they were they're very supportive they were very understanding of the the situation because i had um i had pitched the book to them too um but uh, their first reader was slower. Dawes was very, very excited, and they made a uh, they made a really good offer, and one I couldn't re really reasonably refuse. And um, mm -hmm. you know, my my old employer agreed with me that that was a better offer than she would have made at the time. Uh, yeah. You know, um, and uh, so I was like not wrong to take it, and uh, it was nice. It kind of keep things separate uh, for a while, and now that I'm I'm not working for Bain anymore, uh, it's nice to kind of be back you know with uh with my with my people and uh you know it's nice too that my publisher is 10 minutes away if uh, if there's a problem i can go you know ring the doorbell and uh <laughs> throw a brick through the window or you know whatever whatever's whatever's necessary um but uh yeah no so uh it, it just sort of it sort of depends i tried really really hard to get gene wolf to do a blur because uh, i really wanted mm -hmm. uh I, I sort of wanted the um i, I guess the the imprimatur right or the like approval of you know the people who uh i was i was sort of working off of um you know because uh because sun eater you know i i don't think i'm like that different from other writers with this right uh you know you or from really anybody you know you read a book you think oh that was good but like i really wish like this thing had happened at point x or we gone left instead of right and and over the years you know reading you know 100 200 different books right you you come up with enough you know left turns instead of right turns and enough zigs instead of zags that eventually you're like what if i took all these left turns and put them together right and, and made a story out of it and um but i i, I want to acknowledge you know uh you know where those ideas came from and and my place sort of in the tradition the conversation of science fiction and so I, 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 but I was worried that people would, you know, be critical, like, oh, this is too much like X or Y or Z. And that has been like the one consistent thread of criticism is like people not getting that this was 
this was on purpose and I wanted people to mm -hmm. uh, remember these old books and be in conversation with them because that's true of these old books too if you like like Dune is a critique of and a response to John Carter of Mars um, or a, a princess of Mars is the title of the book John Carter mm -hmm. of Mars is the movie uh, and um, you know they're both about dudes who come from outside who take over the sort of native culture and become king right it's just in John Carter's case like everything's cool Right? In Paul's case, everything is not, because Frank Herbert's opinion is everything would not be cool. Father, the sleeper has awakened! Right? And, like, both of those are valid perspectives, but, like, you know, those older books are also building off of that tradition and conversation. Now, you could say maybe, uh, you know, it was it was subtler or something like that, but uh, we don't live in particularly subtle times. And, um, you know, I, I needed people to, to understand the placement of things. And, and I think for most people, it's worked. Um, but I wanted, I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted, I guess, Kevin's blessing, uh, mm -hmm. which is why I asked him, uh, you know, and I, I tried really hard to get genes too, but it was, it was very near the end of his life. And so, um, you know, I had people who knew him who were trying to get up with him and it just never, just never went through. Um, which is, uh, which is a big shame. Cause I, uh, I've been, I've been told that if I'd only like had the, uh, the, the chutzpah to write a letter myself that he would have answered because like he was like good about answering mail and uh okay. i i never got to speak to gene wolf which is like a huge bummer because he is uh in my opinion he's the greatest science fiction writer of all time and i don't even think it's a close contest uh i just wow. think he's an absolute genius um just in terms of like his craftsmanship right and his attention to detail and his care and his in ingenuity and his sensitivity and humanity as well um you know i just don't what? think anybody has got all of those things dialed up to 10 the way that he did um uh, at least in science fiction or fantasy writers i think tolkien's there um but i think wolf is an even better writer technically than tolkien um would I, book of the new I, sun I be in your top like five science fiction science fiction it's my top five? one book of the new sun is, your top. Okay. is yeah it is, it is it is my number one dune is number two um and uh but i do honestly think that this is kind of scandalous thing i think it's a pretty big gap um dune like i i love dune i love frank herbert but i could i can have I, I have critiques of of frank's world building and his like his pro style and stuff in it that i don't have of of wolf's at all uh, i i the only thing i can maybe say about wolf negatively is that it is very hard uh to understand and so like isn't commercial as a consequence but he wasn't trying to be so like you know he was you know he was a very intentional writer like everything is done on purpose nothing is subconscious like some writers are very uh, they don't know how it is they do what they do they can't explain um uh, how it is they do what they do they just do it and it works and like that's cool um uh and and that like isn't my impression of wolf at all you know to see him talk about his writing uh and be specific and and to read his writing everything is i mean he was an engineer right he <laughs> i don't know this is sort of the, the the famous gene wolf meme right but he designed the pringles machine right uh he uh he built the machine that that shapes the chips right uh for real oh yeah for real that's that's a real fact well he was on the team that did it right? wow. is, is what he would he would always say that's so insane. It, wasn't just, it wasn't just me but i choose to believe the pringles man is gene wolf with his big mustache right i uh that's hilarious every time i go in a grocery store i'm like what's up gene uh oh, yeah wow yeah no, no for real. he was a he was a mechanical engineer uh and uh and he and he writes like one he, you know he is like everything is so precise uh and, and like so meticulous um it's it's like reading a watch it's it's just it's just beautiful beautiful writer um and, and a genius and like and just like so weird and out there but at the same time you know like you know he's also deeply in love with the genre and like book of the new sun is uh is a, a love letter to jack vance right and uh and not just to jack vance there's a lot of lovecraft in it um you know, there's, uh, and there's a lot of, like, um, oh gosh, uh, what's his name? The, like, uh, the, like, literary writer, Finnegan's Wake, um, shoot, the postmodernist, um, jeez, uh, it's the, it's the beer, Aaron, uh, I can't remember his name, <laughs> uh, but, like, you know, he's, but he, but he is, he's just a, he's, he's a, he is a writer's writer, right, uh, but, um, but he's, he's just tremendous, so. Well, I think it's a good time now to get into the very last one that we have here today being my time. So I think this is a good time to get into my time. That sounds good to me. 
Uh, now this uh, is an everybody. area of drinking that I know a little bit about because uh, I have a I have a friend who is all about the tiki drinks, and every time we did go to Dragon Con, Trader Vic's was mandatory. Uh, and uh, uh, having not been in a couple years now, I, I, I miss going. So this one is definitely the most fruity, I guess you could say, tasting one to me at least. You know. Uh, you know, you can kind of get the you can kind of get the mai tai fruit notes in there for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, which I like. So yeah, you got the like, yeah, the pineapple and the orange. Yeah. Would you go back to any of these ones right here? Oh uh, yeah, sure. I, I you know I know it's a light beer, but I like the first one uh, a lot. I thought that. Oh, was the pretty, blonde one. Yeah, I thought it was pretty. That was pretty clean. It was pretty. Dude. Wow, I guess we started off on a strong note then. Yeah, that was good. I oh, like yeah. this one a lot too. Uh, honestly. Uh, I when I when I drink right, you're know, talking about like drinking like a writer. I uh, like Hemingway very famously uh, drank a bunch of like fruity sort of Caribbean cocktails, and that's also sort of my jam. I know that's not a, a sort of stereotypically uh, masculine thing to admit to, but if Hemingway uh, can get away with it, then uh, you know why not, right? Uh, I haven't shot any big game in Africa, uh, you know. So um, you know, I but uh, but this is a uh, you know this is good stuff too. Um, so going going to starting off on a strong note, you know, I know a lot of people's minds, you know, Empire of Silence is considered like the, the, the weakest mm -hmm. entry into the Sun Year series. I think even you are a little bit concerned sometimes when people are starting out because I think even in your mind it's like it's not your strongest work. And um, I know there's a at least right now what I'm seeing there's a huge trend at least in the self publishing world, and even in some you know, published authors too is these prequel novellas that are, you know, short little stories, like 100 pages or less, that allow people to get into, you know, someone's universe with, you know, quick world building, you know, a quick story that gets people engaged and pulled into that, that series really quickly. Now with, you know, Empire of Science being the weakest, I mean, it's not, it's not weak at all, by any means, but with it being the weakest, would you ever consider writing like a prequel novella? Because I know you have novellas out there, but anything you know prior to where we start off with Adrian you know, in you know, Empire of Silence right now, uh, like Roy writing about his childhood or something. Um, I don't know, or even um, like his dad as well. So I, I think his dad story would be a bit larger scale. I don't know if that's in one novel or if that's like a little trilogy or something. Uh, and I also don't know if it's like I don't know if it's interesting uh, enough on its own to sort of merit. The, the time it would take to write. So I, cause like you could do the little like, you know, the House Orin like inner House of War thing. I think it would be good. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the the universe in a lot of ways has like opened up and moved beyond the scope of the story like that in a lot of ways that I don't know that it's very appealing to me to circle back and address that story specifically. Um, but, you know, writing another, another novella that works as sort of an entrepot to the series as a whole, uh, certainly not off the table. Um, I uh, I did the math recently, so uh, people are always asking me like, "Hey, why uh, why are your uh, ebook collections, your short story collections, ebook only? What's wrong with you?" Uh, and what's wrong with me is that when I put the first one out, uh, I felt like forty thousand words like was not long enough to justify a uh, paperback release and it was also even then not comprehensive because there were like four other stories that were still tied up contractually in like other anthologies because usually when you sell a story you don't have exclusive um you give exclusive rights to the person who pays you for it for the first mm -hmm. year for two years whatever two years is usually the upper limit and so i could put out a short story collection but it wouldn't even be all the short stories that i had so I said, why don't I take the seven? I have the rights to reprint, or rather, why don't I take six and write a new story, add it in there, do seven, there's something new, uh, and then put it out digital only for like a couple bucks. So people who really want to read them, but don't want to track down, you know, seven different anthologies can do that, mm -hmm. save them the money, save them the hassle. And I figured if they're not ebook readers, they can read it on their phone. It's very short, they'll deal, right? It'll be okay. It's mostly worked. Um, there have been some people who are not willing to deal, uh, and they're like, "What's wrong with you? Where's the where's the uh, where's the where's the print edition?" And I'll say, "Well, there's an omnibus coming in, as soon as book seven is done." And uh, so one of the things I'm working on is I'm going to have all the short stories, not the novellas, but the short stories, in one wrap-up volume. 
uh, after book seven. But here's the thing, uh, with the special editions of the main books, Empire of Silence, uh, etc., uh, that were the Diamond doing, Editions? The Diamond Editions, yeah, and then the UK special editions were starting next year. Because um, mm -hmm. Derrida books, Derrida, right? yeah, yeah, yeah okay. is is going to do them as well. So they'll be, you know, I was I was joking. It's sort of like Pokemon Red, Pokemon Blue. Uh, <laughs> each one of those is going to have its own different story in the back. So I've been letting my patrons pick the Diamond Edition backup stories. And I'm going to pick the Derrida books ones. Uh, between them, then that's 14 more stories. Like that's a second volume of stories, right? So uh, I have a problem now. This is like kind of hard to explain. Like, it's, so if anybody's eyes are getting crossed, um, you haven't, you know, been into four beers, so get over it. Uh, you know, but um, uh, this means that I have a bunch of extra stories that aren't in those uh, Tales ebook collections. Because I'll, so I'll need to do more of those. It won't end at three like I thought. The first three will go into the first omnibus. And I'll probably do three more ebook short story collections that will go uh, into a second omnibus. So there'll be two short story omnibuses. And that also means that I need to write more novellas to bundle with those second batches of story content. So uh, I will write at least a total of six novellas. I've written three. So there are at least three more I'm going to write that will directly tie into the main Sunday books in some way. Uh, that doesn't mean I can't write more. Uh, and all of this rambling was to say that. Right? Like, I will. I will probably, uh, I will definitely write at least three more novellas is the short version of all the stuff I just said. Um, but uh, I may write more. Uh, one of those could be a prequel. I'm pretty sure the next one will be uh, will be Valka. Um, I, I oh, like, know okay. what that story is. I haven't I haven't outlined it, but uh, uh, but I know what it is. And I don't know who the other two will be. So, uh, but there's time. I need to finish book seven and I'm not really thinking about anything except book seven. Uh, book seven deserves and requires uh, my undivided attention. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I know, uh, like the Dregs of Empire just came out not too long yeah. ago, and and Derrida Books is working on getting those physical editions out here pretty soon, which I'm looking forward to for sure. Yeah, and going to your the new Diamond editions, right? I mean, we have a new kind of style with the front covers, especially with the font in terms of like that kind of 80s kind of retro feel to it which I love by the way oh, and I, also within drags as well I saw that that same type of you know, 80s vibe to it and yeah, we we ended up changing that uh, actually the final version of drags looks like uh, looks like the Daw edition oh um, really okay yeah we swapped it did you get uh, pushback on yeah that? um yeah actually uh, it was it was a little bit brutal people really did not like the uh, the drags cover originally uh, the poor artist, God help him, saw it before I did, and he was just so mortified. Um, and he oh, did exactly no. what I told him to do. I, I he followed uh, he followed my instructions to the T. Uh, he like uh, honestly, John and I had like the most like one to one rapport of like my words to like you know his paintbrush of any of the artists I worked with. Um, he did exactly <laughs> what I said, uh, including the parts that like maybe weren't the best uh, like art direction, right? Um, and so we went back and we revised the cover art um, somewhat dramatically, uh, and then we uh, we retypeset it because looking at it, I uh, I realized that John's art is much closer to Kieran's than it is to James's. And James did the Diamond Edition, so I thought maybe the '80s font, you know, worked better with James's artwork uh, mm -hmm. and less well with with John's. It wouldn't really work with Kieran's either, I think. So, um, you know, I, I've been trying to sort of standardize the look and feel of the uh of the series generally and have like a brand um but you know uh but at the same time you do a special edition you want it to look different right yeah um and so um so now we just got sort of the two looks we've got like the <laughs> the the 80s kind of throwback look which i which i just love and james is so, like all three of them are tremendous artists um, but the but James has that like Drew Struzan like Star Wars movie poster thing yes. going on, which uh -huh. like is science fiction to me. Like when I was a kid, like that was what I wanted to be when I grew up was someone associated with something that looked like that. Um, and so well, like I'm that's really now in the direction that we're gonna go up in Derrida because you know the Diamond Edition looks fantastic. I mean the standard hardcover looks fantastic. Like are we going back to like the fifties now with uh, in Derrida? That would be really cool, and I think actually that uh, Rob at Andarita would be like so psyched if we did that. But no, um, Rob, uh, Rob feels very strongly uh, that uh, what we should do is uh, is keep up what we've been doing with 
the uh, the short story collections and keep Kieran okay. Tanner who did the uh, he did the art uh, for the normal Daw editions. Um, but uh, to sort of do the plus ultra Kieran Yanner covers, right? Not just the one character standing stoically, you know, uh, you know, uh, for a portrait, right? But uh, but do full scenes, do wraparound covers, um, and make it a little more dynamic. We haven't quite figured out what that means exactly in terms of detail, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we uh, we'll, we'll get there. But you, you should expect to see more of the universe, more of the characters. Uh, on those covers and it'll be Kieran's take on them. Um, so there'll be full scenes there and there may be interior art as well where, you know, we're going to look at pricing and stuff. But uh, mm. the and Derrida ones probably, you know, they won't have, you know, a dozen black and white pieces like the, the Diamond Edition does. But they might have two or three full color pieces or something like that. Um, we're not, don't, that that's not, uh, that's not final by any means. But, uh, but we're looking at what we can add to really make those... Uh, to make those as uh, as good as as, as as can be. So, but it'll it'll be Kieran is is the hope. So that's great. The interiors as well. No, yeah, his his art is fantastic, and oh uh, yeah, he's so good. I would I would love to have like a the Howling Dark like poster. Like I looked at his website to check out how much those those pieces were, and definitely a little bit pricey, right? So uh, I haven't grabbed that poster just yet, but um, yeah, I think he's got a smaller intense. one now. I'm not. Uh, I haven't looked in a while, but uh, but those are like art prints, right? They're uh, they're not just mm -hmm. like movie poster, you know. They're yeah. they're uh, you do get what you pay for, but I also <laughs> get it. Um, uh, but those are yeah, those are those are his pieces, so he's got the rights to to, to sell them. So. so I got I got one more kind of like in depth or a little bit more of a deeper question for you okay. before we we wrap this thing up, and it, it it's dealing with language. So I know like Hadrian himself knows a truckload of languages and like we have so many languages within each book and even like the Cielsen language, which is awesome. And just how language is used. I loved how it's used as a tool to like push the plot forward and just how you know, Hadrian uses this language to you know further the narrative as well. And going back, I don't know if you've read this book by um, um, Neil Stevenson called Snow Crash. Yes. Where, yeah, yeah. And, and Snow Crash, you know, his like the message in there is that language is what pr is like the software to our brain. The brain being our hardware in terms of how we grow up and how we structure and how we, you know, realize the world. With that being language, is which is the thing that you know structures that for us. In terms of the Sun Eater universe, do you see like language being somewhat similar to that in terms of like you know Cielsens are obviously opposite compared to. to the humans within this universe use language to your advantage with the, within you know the sun eater universe yeah no i i mean i do broadly think uh, so that's called the it's called the saber wharf hypothesis right it's this idea that the the words and the grammatical structures of whatever languages you uh speak right informs the way that you uh interact with and uh and perceive reality classic example right is i think russian has eight words for blue um, and whereas like Japanese does not distinguish blue from green, right? <laughs> and, uh, at all. And, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is really interesting, actually. Like, there's a whole thing you talk about the history of color words. Um, cause blue, if you look at the history of like basically every language, blue is the last color that differentiates. If you look at ancient Greek, um, they can differentiate light and dark and I think red, uh, but like, that's it. Like there are no blue words. That's why Homer compares the ocean to the, uh, to wine. Right, because uh, he doesn't have blue. There's no blue, uh, so blue is a very recent linguistic invention, right? And so, uh, relatively speaking, right, <laughs> which is which is interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. So a Russian person will look at blue and will be more specific about what they're seeing, and a Japanese person might hand you a green crayon, maybe, right? Uh, maybe not, because like they can still see the difference, but they don't categorize the colors yeah. the same way, right? It's not like their eyes work differently. Um, so like a certain amount of this is, is just true right now. This does not mean that reality is purely subjective, right? Uh, or anything like I, I'm not a like moral relativist. I'm not a subjectivist. Uh, I believe in, you know, uh, objective good and, you know, I'm, I'm a Catholic, right? I believe in, uh, uh, I believe in objective beauty and objective truth too, right? I, I, uh, uh, I, I think that some things are just ugly, man. Uh, but I do think, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, that people like things that are ugly. I think people like things that are, 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 
uh, are a lie. And I think that uh, I think that taste and perception, uh, you know, and you know, obviously cognition itself serve as an interface between objective reality and a person's subjective experience. Um, and uh, with the Cielsen, though, it's interesting because it's not just language, right? Now, their their language certainly shapes how they think about things. This plays a, a particular role in Helen Dark more specifically, right? Uh, their conception of like what peace is and what peace mm -hmm. means uh, makes it actually impossible to negotiate, right? Because <laughs> because you're not willing to do what peace is uh, from their perspective, right? Uh, that's not that's not a that's not a negotiation. Um, but it's also, it's biological, right? The Cielsen occupy a very different evolutionary niche than humanity do. We're, we're pursuit predators, right? They are sort of apex predators. Like they are mm -hmm. obligate carnivores, more or less. Uh, you know, we are, we're omnivorous, right? We, uh, have a different relationship with our environment, uh, and with other life forms than the Cielsen do. And so they are a product of, of, of their biology, um, you know, uh, and biology is destiny, right? uh you know as the old as the old axiom goes and um and so there this is sort of another deeper layer right it's not just it's not just that the language informs reality it's that what you are um informs your reality as well uh to an extent and and you know it's the old adage about like can a tiger change his stripes or you know something like that and, uh, uh, you know, we have this perception in science fiction. We have a lot of silly perceptions in science fiction that uh, that bother me, right? We have this idea that like time is linear, right? Uh, um, you know, like the time, uh, let things just progress, like things just get better, right? Um, uh, I can't remember who was was saying this. It's like I don't know why we would go back to uh, why we would go back to monarchy. Like, shouldn't we have progressed like past that? Like, like what makes you think that that human history uh, is like like leveling up in a video game? Uh, Right. One, it's not clear to me, right, that we've ever invented a new form of government ever, right? Aristotle's perfectly aware of republics and democracies. Uh, and that was 2000 years ago. Uh, but he's also like not so sure that's the best form of government, right? Uh, now, like it has it has its virtues, right? But I think that people have this very like civilization, Sid Meier way of thinking about progress. It's like clearly like the new thing is just better, right? Like not all progress is like getting a new operating system or like a faster processor right um and like that's a weird idea um and this other weird idea is that like the aliens will be like we have like two extremes like either the aliens are completely alien and unreconcilable right mm -hmm. like like the cthulhu right or like they're just like us but with funny foreheads right you know the star trek model and yeah. uh, that's not fair to star trek star trek does both right like star trek's mm -hmm. got like you know the weird jellyfish far point station thing or whatever right um you know they're like yeah we can't talk to that one um you know but then they've also got like the klingons are just like angrier soviets right uh you know <laughs> the Vulcans are just you know uh robots but not really right they're you know space elves the romulans are angry space elves uh you know and, and like you can understand them and like you have this limitation as a science fiction writer right because you're a human being and so like you're a human being imagining things oh good job like you've just imagined something that human being can imagine you're trapped um you can't really make something alien uh you know the seal center like broadly speaking you know based on some of the more horrible cultures in human history um you know the, the specific things that happened to hadrian humans have done to humans right mm -hmm. uh and um that's because of a lot of reasons like you can't like you can only torture human beings so many ways for example right like you know that we all have the same sort of nervous system but um but also like i can't come up with something that a human can't come up with you know it's not possible um and so um uh so i wanted with the cielson uh to sort of try and and get between those two extremes to an extent right because they are accessible you can speak to them you can kind of mm -hmm. understand what they're about um you know but ultimately their motivations are 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 very difficult to square right um and um and i think recognizing like a lot of science fiction tries to, is about trying to like solve that problem right yeah, but what if that problem isn't solvable right uh what if all of your solutions are bad right uh which is which is a situation that we find ourselves in you know in the real world all the time dealing with geopolitical issues right you know like everybody's like can't we just all get along the answer is no right um like maybe you can 
right? Maybe I can, but like everybody, no, everybody is not getting along. Um, and, and it won't happen. And so to the extent that like our literature tells us stories about everybody getting along and magical solutions, um, it's not taking the questions very seriously. You know, I talked about critiquing Frank Herbert earlier, and I always feel like I need to preface this with, I love Frank Herbert. I think he's a genius. I love Dune, but like Dune fundamentally is a thought experiment in trying to solve for tyranny, right? And if you read through God Emperor of Dune, he makes that like very clear. That's what the series is about. And Frank Herbert's solution, have you read through? Uh, uh, I got up to Children of Dune. Okay, okay. Um, I'll Which try to be like as vague insane. as possible, but it's uh, it's. But his solution is: What if I create a tyrant that's so bad, right, and is a tyrant for so long that humanity develops a cellular memory of how bad his tyranny is and will never tolerate tyranny ever again? That's a goofy answer, right? <laughs> Now, like, it's a science fiction answer, right? So it's not bad. And I love God Emperor of Dune. I think it's his best novel. Um, but um, but it is, it's not a realistic answer. And usually the people who are like, wow, Frank is a genius, are, are you know, praising him for being very clear-eyed and pragmatic. And the Golden Path is not a clear-eyed, pragmatic solution to the problem of tyrants exist sometimes, right? It's like, I'm, like sorry, nobody's going to become an immortal worm, man. Mm -hmm. and uh give people race memories because um let me check my notes um race memories aren't a thing um you know people like don't remember what happened 20 years ago much less you know mm -hmm. uh have cellular memories of when they were brand mcmorn uh you know so that's a that's a howard reference that crosses streams there but um you know uh it doesn't work right so like we need to you know sit down and, and and ask ourselves like what do we do when the problem isn't soluble right and like that's not the only thing sun eater is about right uh it's about a lot of other things uh but that is that was like one of those like that was one of those left turns you know i'm reading dune and i'm like this solution does not work frank like i don't like i don't know which president's gonna become the worm man like i don't know uh, <laughs> i just don't see it happening uh I you like know. how you uh, you reference like the negotiation efforts against the or with the CLs and it's just not possible, right? Like the the language barrier is just completely different in terms of what you know peace means between each other, which brings me up to a different book by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which is Elder Race, where language is used like they're saying the same words, but the meaning of those words are completely you know opposite or not the same at all. So like they're saying you know sentences. They're not coming across completely to where it's just the, the, the story or the dialogue between these two is just hilarious. So in this case, it's not hilarious with the CL sin. It's the opposite because uh, there's some um, very traumatic events that happen because of these these uh, conversations that aren't fully you know, comprehended. So yeah, interesting. And, and this is something up. you see in you see in ordinary life, particularly. I won't be too specific, right? Because I don't like talking about current events but particularly in politics like you can pick any political term ever right and it will mean uh you know something dramatically different to people on the left uh, and people on the right right mm -hmm. uh it doesn't matter what the term is right uh, but you can you can very easily see you know like you, you, i'm sure you've seen the comic right where it's the there's a six or a nine drawn on the ground and there are people standing <laughs> at either end of it and pointing at it and they're like six no it's a nine right well you know um words are words are symbols right um and they don't necessarily it, you know exist in a in a, like a platonic absolute sense right they're a lot more they're a lot more mutable there's a there's a bit in gene wolf where he talks about how there are things that are weaker than our words for them uh, and those are the things that we can sort of like the concepts that we can like mush around something like something like a rock is stronger than our word for it because you know we can agree you know uh if we can't agree that this is a rock i can still hit you with it right uh but like we can totally smush around what democracy is right uh and like turn it into something that's not democracy uh and still call it that and everybody's like yes of course um you know uh and uh and so that's something that's weaker than our words for it. And so there's there's a lot of like there's a lot of space to play with that, you know, in literature generally, but in science fiction, especially because of course, and this is like a horrible pun, uh, there's more space in science fiction. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was kind of proud of that one. Uh, but that's uh, good. 
but uh, but this is why I like to write it is because I'm not stuck, you know, with what Homer Simpson called stupid reality. Um, so I think we just need to get to the the universal language that was in the movie Arrival. I don't know if you've seen Arrival, but oh, once yeah, you understand yeah. the that language, we're good to go, man. We're we're gonna prosper. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be nice, right? Uh, you know, uh, sort of the base code of of what is. Uh, you know, uh, maybe such a thing exists. That would be cool. The mathematicians are pretty sure it's math. Um, you know, maybe they're right. Um, but well, uh, they're mathematicians, so they're paid to think that. So. I hope you enjoyed all the beers that we had today. Oh, yeah. And before we go, I wanted to basically leave this off with giving you the floor with anything you want to say at all to anyone that's watching this video. So the floor is yours. You can say anything about your books, about your life, anything that comes to mind. The floor is yours. Oh man, that's a that's a big responsibility. Uh, I guess the the uh, the most important thing that I should say uh, is uh, that uh, my first book, the first book in the Sunny series, is Empire of Silence. Uh, there are uh, five out of the six one. The Squad Cons will be out in uh, in April of next year on the second. Uh, you can check out uh, my series at solidempire.com. It's S O. L L A N Empire.com. I'm here on YouTube as well at Sun Eater Books. Uh, and uh, you know, if you uh, if you like Star Wars, if you like Dune, if you like that tradition of science fiction, uh, I would be honored if you would uh, check the series. Good final last words, and I highly, I also highly recommend anyone to read the Sun Eater series. As you can see right behind me, I got all five right here that's currently published out. With book number six, I'm gonna put it straight on that shelf as well, and. Uh, I think I might need to buy a new shelf, man, because uh, those books are filling the shelf up. Especially if they endear the books. I have the next one right over here, too. So it, it's filling my shelf oh, up, yeah. man. So I appreciate you uh, uh, getting me to spend my money on these amazing books. So, and again. Well, thank you for doing it. Uh, you, know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I say this every time. It always sounds cheesy, but it, it is literally true that, like, I could not do this job without readers. So, you know, thanks, man. Uh, and well, thanks again for the drinks. I yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully you didn't get too tipsy to where your manager will be a little bit upset with you because I know you got a little one. So again, thank you so much for being here. This is a, a dream come true in terms of this whole book tube journey of mine. So I really appreciate it again. So thank you so much, yeah, Christopher. Man. No, thanks for having me. It was, a, it was a joy to be here. So we'll see you again awesome. soon. Awesome. All right, guys. Have a good one. Peace.